Good. Good, good evening, everybody. I, I'm just going to hold for two or three minutes till everyone's joined and the system has stabilized, and then we'll get started. Okay, it looks to me as if this, uh, everyone who's joining has connected correctly, so um, I'm going to start the meeting. Very warm well welcome to everybody. Um, it always feels, I, have, I still haven't quite got used to holding public meetings this way, it feels kind of odd, it's not the usual kind of um, opportunity to have a bit of crack beforehand, but um, we'll get used, we'll, we'll survive this for a bit longer and hopefully get back to proper public meetings in due course. Um, my name is Andrew Thin, uh, Chairman of the Scottish Land Commission. It had been our intention to have this evening uh, Sally Reynolds, who's one of the land commissioners, and uh, David Adams, who's one of the land commissioners, and Hamish Trench, who's our chief executive. Sally sadly has had a crisis and can't join us, but we David Adams and we so um, but before I invite them to introduce themselves let me just do a couple of housekeeping things this meeting is being recorded so that we can put it up in due course on our YouTube channel in case folk want to, to to see it who haven't been able to see it now if you don't want to be recorded please simply um switch off your camera and indeed switch off your microphone and then you can you can listen but you're not being recorded so that's all fine um I'll explain the format in due course but first of all some introductions Myself, been chairman of the Scottish Land Commission since it started in 2017. Um, I have, over the years, chaired a number of public bodies. I also, at the moment, chair Scottish Canals. I work in the prison service and one or two other things. Um, so that's my background. And I'm going to ask David. David, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm one of the uh, land commissioners. Uh, the commissioners are... Um, part-time roles uh, to set the uh, real strategic direction for the Scottish Land Commission and was supported by uh, a very able group of staff uh, led by Hamish Trench uh, based in Inverness. Um, I'm formerly uh, a professor at uh, Glasgow University. Uh, my interests are mainly in regeneration, vacant derelict land, housing, urban development. Um, and that's sort of my, my, my background. Um, I'm now uh, actually staying in the Scottish borders, hence uh, the scene behind me. So uh, very interested to uh, join you tonight and uh, hear the questions coming uh, from, from Asia. Thank you. David, thanks very much indeed. And I'm going to reveal a secret, which is that it's not actually snow covered in the borders at the, at the moment. And that this is a fraud, this photograph, but there you go. Um, and Hamish, would you like to introduce yourself? Hamish. Oh, yes, I'm Hamish Trench. I'm the Chief Executive of the Commission, um, leading the staff team. We've got a small staff team of around 16 um, people working across our work on policy, practice and uh, corporate support. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I live in Granton on Spey, um, so not snowy here either at the moment, but I'm delighted to join you tonight and look forward to the discussion. Emmy, thanks very much indeed. So, just a brief word of, of why we're doing this and the format and so on. Um, but first of all, why do this? We, we, we've held public meetings pretty much every month since we started in 2000, early 17, 2017. Um, they, were, they have been hugely important in shaping the work we do. We're a tiny wee organisation. Our job primarily is to advise government and indeed to advise others. Um, we've got very limited resources. I think we're the smallest public body in Scotland, pretty much. Um, so we have to prioritise. And what we prioritise depends on what people tell us they, they think the priorities are. So these meetings have been massively important from the beginning. They shaped the first three-year plan, they shaped the second three-year plan, and they will in due course shape the third three-year plan. Um, so please um, you know, treat, treat this as an opportunity to talk to us about your priorities. That's point one. The second point is that we are public servants. This is a public body. We're paid by you. Um, you fund this thing. So, we, so this is an, also an opportunity for you to hold us to account and you should feel free to do so. I think it's very important that public bodies do put themselves and particularly 
to the boards of public bodies, put themselves out into the public domain uh, and, and are, are, are open to challenge. So you should do so. We, we, we want to be held to account. I think it's, that's, that's the way to drive up quality in these, these bodies. Um, as I say, we've, we, we, we did them every month in all over the country, uh, and we've been there, and we had one in air, in fact. Um, but of course, since COVID, we've had to try and do this online. Um, it's working pretty well. There are some strengths. Some people can join these public meetings who previously were unable to get along to the local hotel or whatever, uh, or village hall. So in that sense, it's been a plus. The downside, of course, is the format is a bit impersonal, and I apologize for that. Don't get the chance to have the crack. You don't get the chance actually to, to, to have the private conversations you might have liked. But by and large, we found that this format works well, and I hope it will as well tonight. The format um, is pretty straightforward, really. Um, Hamish is going to speak for about 10 or 15 minutes and just give you a very quick run through of what, you know, what, we, what we're currently doing. Um, but it will be a, a, a gallop um, and it will be pretty superficial because I, I don't want to take up too much time with talking to you. We want to listen to you and discuss with you. Um, so it will be very brief. And following that, uh, we're, we will open this up for discussion. and I'll explain how that will work after Hamish has, has, has done his wee presentation. So that's, that's the format. And I'm now going to hand over to Hamish. And in about 15 minutes or so, when he's finished, I'll talk you through what we're going to do next. Hamish, over to you. And he's, Hamish is going to share his screen so you will see some, some um, slides as he, as he goes through it. Over to you, Hamish. Thanks, Andrew. And I'm just getting the slides up here, so we should see this shortly. Great. So hopefully you can all see the slides um, there. Yeah, you're all good. Thank you. Um, so yeah, this will be a, a kind of short overview, really, just to set the scene of the, the work that the, the Land Commission is involved in. Um, and I'll start really by just sharing a few thoughts on what land reform is all about um, and, and, and what is it. When we talk about land reform, a lot of people may instantly think of things like this, um, looking at rural Scotland. And of course, land reform has a long history um, in Scotland, particularly uh, in rural Scotland, uh, where we've seen significant drive uh, and energy coming um, to shape land reform. But increasingly, land reform is also about urban Scotland. Um, it's as much about sorting out vacant and derelict sites in the middle of our towns and cities. Um, it's about our housing, urban property, and how people in the middle of cities engage with the land and space around them. Uh, just in the same way as it is um, in rural Scotland. It's about big picture issues, about how we you know, provide land for housing, how we meet some of the big challenges Scotland has uh, in meeting our housing needs, um, our infrastructure needs. Um, and of course, it's also about very, very local facilities. Um, the Garnet Valley Community Hub pictured here, um, local as an example, uh, community-led regeneration. Um, land reform spans very much the, the community needs right up to some of our big um, national challenges. And I think one of the things we would like to certainly emphasize um, right from the start here is that yes, land reform is about legislation and policy, um, but it's also about culture uh, and practice. Uh, and actually a huge amount of what can change and does change um, comes down to culture and practice on the ground. Um, land reform, of course, has a hugely strong history in Scotland. Uh, we've seen several phases of land reform uh, with legislative change. Um, actually, that reform is particularly relevant to some of the big challenges that we face at the moment. Um, so when we look at some of the big public policy drivers, some of the big challenges that are, are facing us at a community level and at a national level, uh, meeting our climate targets and particularly making a just transition um, to a net zero economy, um, how we improve uh, our economic productivity and the value that creates for society, moving towards a well-being economy. Um, and how we reduce some of the inequalities uh, in Scotland and ensure that the wealth that does exist in Scotland is shared fairly and productively. Land and land reform is, is absolutely central um, to some of these big challenges. So at the Land Commission, um, the Commission itself was set up by Parliament um, back in 2017. Um, and really the thinking behind setting up the Commission at that point was to make sure that land reform moves from being a stop-start process to something that is um, continually part of Scottish life. Uh, something that continually allows us to evolve, adapt um, and change laws, policy and um, culture um, to meet the needs of, uh, of people in Scotland, to meet our ambitions and changing needs. And fundamentally, it is a, a hugely positive agenda about making more of Scotland's land um, for everyone in Scotland and how we unlock uh, the benefits um, that land can bring. 
The commission itself, as you've heard, is led by um, a group of six commissioners, five land commissioners, um, and one tenant farming commissioner, um, working with a small staff team. Now, one of the, the really fundamental sort of foundation points for us is uh, something called the, the Land Rights Responsibilities Statement that the Scottish Government um, introduced uh, as a result of the, the last Land Reform Act. And this is a statement of rights and responsibilities that go uh, with land uh, for landowners, land managers, communities, and indeed for anyone in interest in land. Uh, and it's, it's really a foundation about the relationship between people and land um, that the Scottish Government is trying to support and promote. It's the first of its kind in the world, the first time a country has tried to put into words this relationship um, and set that out in a set of principles. And at the Land Commission, um, we have a particular role to help actually turn this into practice and help people work out what this means in reality in terms of responsible practice um, and how these connections play out. And I'll say a bit more about that um, in a minute. If I turn to the, the main areas of work that we're involved with as a Land Commission, um, our priorities really um, are about who owns the land uh, in terms of land rights, about how land uh, is owned and used um, in terms of responsible land ownership and use, um, and about how we value, develop and use land in terms of the way markets operate um, and what that means and how we unlock more benefits um, from that. And I think in the chat function as we go along, you'll see some links that do come through to our website. Um, and if you're interested in finding a bit more about our plans and current areas of work, um, the website has sections um, on all of these with more information. Looking a little bit about land rights, um, you know, who, who owns land and how it's owned influences for many parts of our life. Um, distribution of power, wealth and resources, practical access to housing infrastructure, um, community facilities, etc. So the key areas of work that we're looking at on this are about how we encourage and support a more diverse pattern of land ownership across Scotland. Um, and how we help support new governance models and different governance models that widen the benefits um, from land. When we look um, particularly around international experience um, and we've looked across Northern Europe and elsewhere, um, actually Scotland's quite unusual in thinking about our land ownership being very much about either public, private or community uh, in different sectors. Often we see land ownership in a much more mixed and shared models. Uh, and that's some of the work around governance models that we're looking at at the moment is how do we mix and get the strengths from all of these sectors and share the benefits of land um, more widely. And then human rights is a, is a fundamental part of the Scottish approach to land reform um, and with a new human rights bill on the horizon as well that reshapes the balance between property rights and wider economic, social, cultural rights. That's all part of understanding how do we unlock more benefit from the way that land rights and land ownership um, is organised. And one of the particular areas of work we focused on um, over the last few years is looking at the impacts of addressing concentrated land ownership, one of the first things that the Scottish Government asked us to look at. Um, and earlier this year, in fact, we've, we've made three recommendations um, in terms of a public interest test and other things. Uh, and uh, the, the current Scottish Government in the, the SNP Green um, Programme for Government is committed to a land reform bill within this Parliament. Uh, one of the things in which um, that will address is a public interest test of some form uh, on transactions, large scale, uh, significant land transactions. And that really gets to the heart of looking at some of the issues that underlie um, concentrated pattern um, of land ownership. But of course, it's also about much wider than that. It's about land use and how we how we make the most of land. Um, and in terms of um, responsible land ownership, one of the things that's really um, gathered momentum over the last couple of years is our good practice program, um, which is all about helping people put into practice those principles in the land rights and responsibilities statement. Really, this is about what does good look like on the ground? Um, what can communities expect? What can landowners expect? What can land managers expect? And indeed, what should they expect of each other um, in terms of responsible practice uh, about the rights and responsibilities of ownership on the ground? We've published eight um, protocols and you can see examples of the kind of documents that are produced here. And again, you'll find links to these um, on our website. Um, and these protocols set out basic practical expectations of what reasonable practice looks like. Um, for example, on community engagement. Uh, just helping people understand what are the expect expectations around engaging communities in decisions um, about land. And I think especially in, a, in an airshow context, actually, we, we've been speaking recently with local authorities in the area about the connections between this and the community wealth building approach um, that is um, moving ahead so rapidly in airshow. Um, and really some strong connections, you know, the how, how we make more of land uh, and property assets um, to benefit and reinvest in the local economy is an absolutely core part of uh, community wealth building and strong connections between that and the land rights and responsibilities 
um, approach and how we can help embed and support um, that approach. And then the final area I would touch on is just our work on land markets. Um, and some of the key areas that we're looking at here, recently, um, back in August, we published a, a major research report looking at the operation of a housing land market. A uh, fundamental conclusion in that is that actually the speculative market and the way it works at the moment um, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't deliver sufficiently on the public interest for Scotland, and we need a much more active role um, for public bodies uh, and public uh, sector in driving the kind of market, uh, the housing delivery that we need. Uh, we'll be publishing um, some advice on tax reform in relation to land reform um, to ministers just at the start of the next new year. Um, and I'll come on in a minute to talk a bit about the, the current issues around land value uh, and market drivers in the rural land use. But first, one of, the, one of the big areas of work to highlight is certainly around vacant and derelict land. Um, in the early, uh, back in 2018-19, the Vacant and Derelict Land Task Force uh, really took a fresh look at how Scotland approaches uh, its long-standing legacy of vacant and derelict sites. And of course, these are sites right in the heart of towns and communities across Scotland, um, having a major impact on, on social, economic um, uh, in impact and, and of course just on the quality of place. Um, really quite striking when you think about across Scotland, one in three of us lives within 500 metres of a derelict site. Uh, and if you think about the impact that has on daily quality of life, um, it's, it's really quite an important uh, issue for Scotland as a whole. The task force has transformed the, the approach to this and, and really um, shifted the culture to bring these sites back into productive use. And there's a huge amount of activity flowing from that now. Um, backed with additional funding from government to help bring vacant and derelict sites back into um, productive use. I mentioned the, the housing, housing report. Um, again, you'll find a link to this on our website if you're particularly interested and we can pick it up in discussion. Um, but again, the, the, the core conclusion from this really is about the need for a much more active public sector to really drive the kind of delivery of housing and the quality of housing in the places that it's really needed. Um, and again, we, we know from speaking with partners in Ayrshire, this is a, a particular focus in the, the community wealth building approach and with local authorities um, in the area as well at the moment. And then I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about um, a very current and actually one of the newest areas of work um, that we're looking at. Um, around us at the moment, we're seeing some significant change in the rural land market. Um, we can see a new value in rural land emerging, um, being associated with carbon, carbon trading and natural capital. You know, as Scotland makes the transition to a net zero economy, um, it's not surprising that investors and banks and, and financial institutions are starting to put their investment into that net zero transformation. And of course, some of that is coming into the land market. We are doing some work at the moment to understand the implications um, of the, the new value in the land market, what this means, um, the kind of transactions that are occurring. And I think one of the core questions we're looking at is really how do we harness this value for public and community benefit? Um, how do we ensure that some of the new value being created is being reinvested locally um, for community benefit and indeed is being captured more widely for, for public benefit in return? Um, and in this very new market uh, around carbon and natural capital, uh, what does responsible practice um, look like? So this is a very rapidly um, developing area of work um, and we'll certainly see more of this to come um, in the next few months and in the coming year. Finally, um, the, the final area I'll touch on is the Tenant Farming Commissioner. Um, just to flag that part of the remit of the Land Commission is to support the work of the Tenant Farming Commissioner, which is all about supporting good relations between agricultural landlords and tenants. Um, he does that through a series of codes of practice, guidance, advice, um, and very practical advice for people on the ground in terms of how to maintain, build, and keep good relationships uh, and ensure that we have a thriving tenant farming sector. So that's a very quick run through, and it is a, a very kind of um, very quick overview of the main areas of work we're involved in. Before I finish, I'm just flag. Um, if you're interested in more, you can certainly find out on our own websites and indeed on myland.scot, um, which is a, a new website flagging up case studies and examples of lots of activity going on out there, and particularly focused on actions that communities are taking themselves to transform the places um, where they live. And as part of that, we've got a podcast series that's out. And again, I'd encourage you to, to dip in and have a listen um, to some of the podcasts that are just um, really about helping uh, or, or listening to, to people who, who can connect and are connecting what land means to them in a very personal and very real life um, situation. So do please have a dip into these. Um, I hope that gives you some sense um, of the work that the Land Commission is involved in, um, but really we'd like to hear from you tonight in terms of the, the issues that matter locally and um, where you are. So I'll pass back to you, Andrew. Thanks.
Emmy, thanks very much indeed. So that was a great gallop, and you've already prompted some some points in uh, and discussion points in the chat. So that's also excellent. You've obviously done a good job there. Thank you. Um, and I'll come on to those in a second. Let me just explain now how we'll try and make this work uh, to best effect. Um, first of all, um, in behind the scenes, we have two really helpful people, Jess and Posey, who will be putting up um, web links as we go along uh, on the issues that are being discussed. And, and that's really just to help you find more information if you're interested. Uh, you can either um, you know, click on those and record them now, or, or as I say, this whole thing will be available on, on YouTube. Or you can just go to our website and use the search function, and you'll probably find them just that way as well. But those two ladies are, are, will be doing a great job behind the scenes as we go along. Um, the second thing to say is that we, we will, um, fairly shortly, I'm not sure, when Jess or, or Posey will be putting up a poll inviting you to just indicate, here it goes, gosh, that was very clever, somebody. Um, thank you. So we're just asking you, this just really helps us give it, to, get, to get a few, what are the things that concern you most in your part of the country? Because clearly Scotland's a diverse country. And we ask this question at public meetings all over the country and we get different answers as you'd expect. So it really help us if you would just click the things that concern you most and it'll give us a feel and may help to shape some of the discussion. So please, please do that. Um, the discussion will last until no later than 8.30. Um, I think it's only fair to let people get away at a fixed time. So I will close it at 8.30, even if we're still going strong. Um, that's, that's the plan. In order to have a conversation that works online, there's two options. There is the chat function, and one or two of you are using that already, and that's great. And I will try and keep up with whatever you're saying. If you all start hammering into the chat function, I'll probably lose track, and so forgive me if that happens, but I'll do my best. But there is also a button that says raise hand on your screen. And if you want to click on raise hand, then I will in, then I should be able to see you, and I will invite you to, 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 to offer your thoughts uh, verbally, and you can then unmute yourself and offer your thoughts, and that would be great. That's a good way of, slightly more human way, frankly, than, than banging into a chat function, but I appreciate chat functions so, uh, all often suits people, uh, so please, please use it. Um, so that's the way we'll do this. Um, uh, and, well, I'll, you know, I'll take a few comments, and then I'll maybe go back to Hamish and David and offer a few sort of thoughts and response. Feel free to ask questions if that's what you want to do, but feel free, I think, particularly to offer your thoughts, and, and, and that's beginning to happen on the chat already. We want to hear your thoughts. Um, so over to you. Use the chat raise hand function. There's Sally got her hand up. Wonderful. Um, uh, and, and we'll hear from you. And as I say, we'll hear. I, I'll just I'll try and manage the conversation as best I can. It's not easy with uh, I'd much rather be in a village hall, but I'm old fashioned, um, but I'll do my best. Uh, so, Sally, uh, let's start with you. Sally Campbell's got her hand up. Please, your thoughts, please. Um, I live on the Isle of Arran. Uh, I'm a member of Arran Civic Trust, and we are very concerned with the sense of place. Um, I First of all, thank you very much. That was incredibly informative and uh, I shall go search the th thing. So thank you very much, Hamish. Um, two things struck me, really. One is, how do we reform the price of land for housing uh, and stockpiling land for housing, which drives up everything and makes it impossible for younger people without a lot of capital to buy into property and therefore, certainly around Aaron, the difficulty now of getting uh, workers, uh, artisans, and so on. So very much more dependent then upon local authority housing. That's the first thing. Second thing, I'm, a, I'm very interested in the whole idea of everyone jumping on the carbon trading wagon. Uh, which seems to me a bit of a great deal of greenwashing on part of companies and landowners who are going to sell them carbon rights, which means that a lot of the large corporates will not need to actually do something constructive and difficult and costly to actually reduce their carbon emissions. And that would make me extremely concerned and have me marching up and down 
if in fact I felt that to anyone who now owns large tracts of land will say, well, we're going to rewild, we're going to plant 900 trees, and then we're going to sell the carbon. We know it'll take 50 years for the trees to grow. Um, and by the time we've had another few wins, uh, they'll have all blown down anyway. So I think there is that real concern in my heart about that. The third thing is about culture and culture and you can hear my voice is English, although I'm married to a Campbell, which might make me acceptable. Um, the whole idea of losing the culture that is so precious on the islands uh, and in other communities, not just on islands. And so I'm very uh, pleased to see that that is obviously at the heart of what some of the things you're going to be doing. So those are the three sort of areas that I, I immediately thought, oh, Thank heaven someone's talking about it. So thank you. I thank you very much. The, f the first two are probably two of the biggest issues of, of our time. <laughs> and the third one is, is probably one of the most impossible issues of our time, but that's very helpful. I'm going to, I, I will come to David and Hamish in a second, but let's hear from others first of all, and let's hear a few thoughts and then I'll try and uh, come back to, to the other two. So Walter, Walter Young's got his hand up. Walter, let's hear your thoughts and then I'll come to John. John Inglis has also got his hand up. Walter. Hi there, uh, local farmer in here, sir. I uh, totally agree with Sally there. And on your speech, Hamish, you were talking about supporting new entrants, supporting young farmers, succession farming. I mean, I honestly don't see how that happens when, as a farmer, Sally was talking about hundreds of trees. I mean, the companies next to us now have millions of trees. It's millions, thousands of acres. How can you support new entrants into farming and succession farming when, well, you weigh up the figures, the economic for farming is this value. I mean, up here, up here is your value for trees. And as Sally says, I mean, more storms, more trees. I honestly think the government will realise too late, we cannot eat trees. Food is getting scarce, not only here. I mean, some of the best productive land in this area will go for planting trees. We cannot eat trees. And it's not just a local issue, this is worldwide. So I totally agree with Sally. Walter, thanks very much. I recently um, went through both Ayrshire and down into Dumfries and Galloway. I have to say I was astonished at the amount of land getting planted up um, for trees. It was quite remarkable. Um, and there are some very difficult challenges in there. John, well, down... We're actually doing my part for the green because you would also notice the turbines within 10 miles of us, yes. there's hundreds and hundreds of, and there's still a lot more in scoping and in planning and more for erection. So, I mean, you know the area quite well. I, I mean, I passed through it. I passed through it, through it quite often, actually, and uh, yeah, it must have the highest density of wind turbines, I think, in, in the country. Let's hear from John. John Inglis. John, you're muted. I'm afraid. Sorry. That's okay. it. Yeah. Uh, Hamish, uh, that was a lot you had to say there. I wondered if, at the beginning of all this, did you ever consider? nationalizing all the land in Scotland and beginning from that point. Okay. Um that's that's that, you're not the first person to say to say that either. So that's very helpful. Now I'm just going to pause. This is where it gets difficult to manage these discussions. I'm going to pause for two reasons. First of all, because um Jess and Posey have put uh, a summary up of the poll so you can see actually lots of priorities in air and airshire um that's probably a more diverse spread of priorities um than i've seen elsewhere um that's very helpful we will try and or i will try and ensure that the conversation covers all these things and particularly the ones that are showing as being higher priority so community control housing and so on and on that note i wonder if we could just pause and have some thoughts from david who is very thoughtful and very expert on the whole issue of of housing and 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 so we sally's first point really david that um we've got problems with land banking we've got problems with the cost of you know the cost of a, a house site has grown over the last 30 or 40 years at an extraordinary rate much faster than inflation whereas the cost of building a house has probably tracked inflation so just your general thoughts and contributions to, to Sally, and and more generally for, for for there's 40 odd people on the call now just more generally on that subject david okay thanks andrew thanks sally and i noticed that 
uh, Kay Hall um, and Barbara Sharp are, are, are asking sort of similar types of questions. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, I, I, I think what perhaps is, is not well appreciated is um, all the problems we have in the housing market, um, many, many of them are attributed to problems in the housing land market. In other words, who controls the land before housing is built. And actually, they tend to remain in the background because people concentrate on planning arguments and don't really understand how um, controlling the land market in the background gives um, particular players real power. Now, I have to say, um, this whole issue has been of huge concern to the Scottish Land Commission. Um, we ourselves ha have um, published work and, and, and we've commissioned work from a number of other people, all of which is on, on the website. Um, but the key thing is, uh, we this year we have um, submitted two ministers and we have published what I think is one of the most radical reports on reforming the house and land market that we've seen in Scotland for many a year. And it's really a question of whether ministers are willing to go with that or not. But if they were willing to go with that, it would make a huge transformation to all the issues that have been raised. So I just want to quote, um, without getting into the detail of the report um, in, in full, although I, I could sort of explain various proposals, but I just want to quote one sentence that summarizes it all. And, and it's really that um, I think agreeing with what has been said as the diagnosis of the problem, um, and then saying this, so to quote, it says, we need to move away from a housing land market driven by private profit to one that is driven by the public interest. This will require the public sector to take a much more proactive role in strategic land promotion. The process is simply too important to be left to market forces alone. Now, we can discuss all the detailed proposals if you'd like, but what I would say in summary is, is, is that this issue has been the center of what the Commission's thinking, and we have produced some very radical proposals that would completely shake up the way housing is built in Scotland. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, David. So, so that's, I, I, I want to let uh, um, our audience participate, so we'll keep our contributions brief, but that was very, uh, admirably succinct. Thanks, David. Hamish, I wonder, uh, another theme that was coming through there um, is the whole business of carbon sequestration. The term greenwashing was used, um, and we've heard some of these thoughts in other public meetings. On the other hand, carbon is a serious problem, and, and, and government is, is, is taking it seriously. Do you want to offer some thoughts? We, 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 I mean, we, 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 I should say, perhaps, so that everyone's aware of this, that we're working at the moment on, on, on this issue, and we haven't yet published advice. But maybe you could say a bit about your thoughts and also the work we're doing, Hamish. Please. Yeah, I mean, I think in the in the big picture, there are there are lots of people in Scotland um, that are concerned about the risk of greenwashing, and I, and I think we kind of have a shared interest to make sure that the the policy and regulatory framework that comes into place um, addresses that up front. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear that um, the way carbon codes and the carbon markets operate, um, if companies are looking to offset carbon emissions, they really should be emissions that simply cannot be um, removed from businesses in any other way. Um, now, of course, lots of assurance and, and kind of um, regulatory uncertainties around that. But the, the bit that we're focusing on in particular is how that interacts with the land market. Um, and we can see certainly that corporates and businesses are starting to buy into the land market, specifically driven by carbon trading motivation um, and, and wider natural capital motivation. Um, we can see some high prices being paid. So we have at the moment some work underway to actually put some evidence on the table around that. Uh, really understand the number of transactions, the scale, the value involved, and the motivations behind them. Uh, the other aspect that we're looking at is trying to put in place some clear expectations for responsible practice. Um, for example, around engaging communities in the land use change um, that may flow from this, um, but more or as importantly, actually ensuring that some of the benefit is returned, um, including financial benefit, returned to local economies um, and communities. 
and we will be developing some principles and some guidance on that um, as part of our responsible practice program um, in the new year. So I think there's 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 a rapidly developing policy and regulatory framework around this, but there's also frankly a lot that can be done um, by responsible investors and land landowners in practice now without necessarily waiting for that. Hamish, thanks very much. Um, now, I've got another hand up, so I'm going to hear from our audience in a second. I just want to very quickly, I'm trying to keep track of the chat as it shoots past. Um, so th there's a question there about are we mapping what land is best for forestry and so on. I think the forestry, it's not called forestry commission, but whatever it's called now, Forest and Land Scotland, is doing its best to try and map what's suitable for forest and what's not. And there's also a question there about is there a, 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 a legislation on vacant and derelict land not 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 a bill as such on that at the moment although there are there may be other legislation that's relevant david i think you've got your hand up maybe wanting to add something before i come to timothy uh, yeah i'm just going to reply to that comment on mapping agricultural land by putting yeah. the web link where Thank all you. the information is available sorry say that again david uh, i'm just going to respond to the comment on or question on mapping the quality of agricultural land by putting the web link where all that information from government on agricultural land quality can be found. And, and, and basically you can look at your area, look in the map. Brilliant, thanks very much indeed. Great. Um, Kay, I, I, you, I'm not sure, I mean, you obviously, you can copy those links and, and stick them on, a, on, on something yourself. Uh, the, 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 um, this whole thing will be recorded. Uh, but but actually the very simple thing is just go to our website and use the search function which is pretty good actually now let's hear from other people so timothy billings has got his hand up timothy let's hear from you first please thank you um yeah i think actually that uh, uh, well what i wanted to say was around the uh, the comments you were making around the um the changing of uh, the drivers from profit to a public interest for housing development that's a very interesting one and i was just asking go ask where the where the where the report is for that but i think you might have already posted that actually on the uh, in the chat i've just i've just seen it there but i certainly would support that i'm a i'm a i'm a, 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 a local councillor on a planning committee um and yeah we see a lot of developments come through and there's, and there's limited amount of work we can do on the uh, on, on actual sort of design of things and how crowded they are and obviously there's a certain amount we can do but certainly you know these are housing developments that are going to be there for you know hopefully a very long time because they're much needed houses but you know we don't want to be creating a uh, we want to create some of those nice, nice to live, not not just essential. Timothy, thank, thanks very, very much. And, and um, I, I was going to pick up, I, I maybe will in a second, the wider point about the link between local government and national government policy, which picks up some of this. But you'll see in the report, which you'll find on, on the website, that, that we are saying, look, I'm paraphrasing here, but, but we need a more muscular public sector in the housing uh, in the housing business whether that's the local authority or others and you'll see that in the report we can come back to this in the discussion and David Adams will be able to and the Hamish will be able to say more if we want but let's hear from you first so John's got his hand up again John Inglis sorry I appreciate it. I haven't dealt with your nationalization point yet uh, John you're you're muted you're muted John I I did want to know if it, if it had ever been uh, considered. But over to the housing issue and the problem of land, I also am on the Aaron. And I've also, I've always been irritated by the fact that a large amount of allocated building land is issued on the island and it's banked by virtually two people for years and years. Surely allocated building land should be granted on condition and perhaps with a time limit. Uh, I think that's a reform we desperately need. It would certainly help the situation on Arran where we have hundreds of people in need of a house. And the local authority, which only owns the small bit of land, is busy building on it. And fair enough to them. But you talk about the local authority being more aggressive. I do think that's necessary. And I noticed this North Ayrshire's uh, 
wealth building uh, policy, over the mainland there, they are intervening and uh, compulsorily purchasing buildings and land. I would like to see more of that. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, I just want to pick up at your point about nationalisation, and then I'm going to come to David Adams for a wee bit more on housing, David. Actually, no, I think, I, sorry, forgive me, Kay's got her hand up, so I think we should hear from Kay. Kay Hall, if you can hear me, your thoughts, please. Yes, I think I'd like to share the frustration of how little impact uh, as local communities we have on any of the release of land um, for building. Our community council vehemently opposed the release of greenfield sites for a new build in their local development plan too. Uh, it was totally ignored and two fields which are geese field uh, feeding fields in our community. They're much loved fields. Um, there's a, a, a beautiful walk by the side of them have now been sold for vast quantities of money or the, the process is going on by a local farmer and community wealth building, which I welcome, Joe Cullinane, you know, I'm, I'm really delighted that he's, he's done this as a pilot in Scotland, really. I mean, hands up to him, he's, it's excellent. But we're talking about community wealth building and who are building on these fields? Persimmons, you know, it's just contrary to everything they're saying. So I, I go back to that point to make the disconnect between community empowerment, community voice, local authorities, and what national um, the national developments are saying, it's up the creek. I mean, there's no connection at all. It's very, very frustrating. So I, I, I'd, I'd like to pause again, if I may, and explore that a bit, Hamish, perhaps with you first. So, so we work with local authorities, or we have contact with local authorities. Um, ultimately, of course, the local authorities are answerable to, to local people. Um, not to anybody else, but but you know we see good and bad, I guess. Hamish, hey, hey, your thoughts on how we might sort of imp people get frustrated, and sometimes that's because actually the silent majority in the electorate simply want something different. But but so sometimes there is a disconnect. Do you want to offer any thoughts on 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 that and the whole business of of translating? What is it? What is you know? We're a national advisor, translating that at a local level. Well, I can certainly offer try and offer a few thoughts on it, um, and and we do we do connect kind of closely with local authorities in in quite a number of these areas of work actually. And and one of the things that strikes me as an overall kind of observation is the key role that local authorities have, um, and if particularly in in improving land governance and and local connection to land governance and decisions. And again, if you look internationally, it's quite clear that, that local authorities and municipal authorities um, have a huge part to play in, in determining um, land use outcomes, land use objectives, and, and engaging kind of communities in the benefits there. So there is actually quite a lot of international experience we can draw on as well um, in looking at this local national relationship, uh, which again is quite different in Scotland in some ways. Um, we certainly connect in terms of the housing front, and, and as Andrew said, the recommendations we made um, we were very much intended to sort of strengthen the hand of local authorities um, in relation to being more active and more directive in housing. Um, but I've got to be honest, we I think we all probably recognise the, the capacity constraints that local authorities are working within, and, and actually that is a very real um, constraint uh, in making some things happen, um, and we come across that in the vacant derelict land work as well. Um, there is a there is a real will to to do things and to get things done, um, but there is undoubtedly um, constraints on their ability to to act um, across the piece at the moment. Um, and I think the the other aspect I was going to pick up, um, which someone mentioned in the chat there in relation to local authorities, is common good land, of course, as well, uh, which is another area that we touch on with with local authorities. And actually, we have in fact published a, a protocol on responsible management of common good land. Um, and hopefully we can get the, the link to that coming up in the chat shortly as well. That's available on our website. Um, so some of the questions that have been raised about um, engagement, community engagement in common good land and how that is managed. Uh, again, there is a clear framework for doing that well. Um, and actually, it's an area of work that we have looked at in terms of whether um, legislative reform is also needed to, to modernise um, the approach to, to common good land. So I think 
there, there are lots of connections there, but I think the, yeah, overall we we see local authorities as playing absolutely pivotal part in bridging between the, the national and community um, ambitions here. Oh, thanks very much. Um, now, uh, yeah, I, I suppose that I might just add a thought of my own, which is that in practically all walks of life, 95% of people are good people doing their best. And I don't think local authorities are actually all that different, but, the, but the, the, there are some real challenges and we need to try and find ways of overcoming those challenges. No question of that. And, and, um, Andrew, would you mind if I came yeah, back at some point? Of course you can. Uh, you've actually got your hand up, so I was going to come I, I to you. So that's I, think, I think sometimes <laughs> people think that it's been left up from before, but I did take it down. Um, I think, I think there's two things I'd like to share with you. The first one is that I, I think we've got a good planning department in North Ayrshire, so I, I don't want this to be taken critically of them. And I know they're award winning and there's really, really fine officers in it. Mm -hmm. But you're up against a very sharp develop, development here with building. And we, we know of companies now that have been set up by the big boys to make maximum profit. They fly into your local authority. They advertise with farmers. We we can uh, sell your land for you. You know we can develop your land. We'll do all the the blood, sweat, and tears. You'll get this amount of profit out of it. And they they are extremely successful. And our local authorities need to get a bit sharper about this um, uh, because these guys are professionals. They they only do that one thing, and they know how to do it extremely well. As persimmons do, we've got a fight against persimmons, and I, I personally don't think we'll win. And the second part for me is that we're an oddly desirable um, area in North Ayrshire. North Ayrshire has got immense problems, and you'll know that. But we're very desirable. If you build prestigious houses around our edge, you will sell them. So we are getting development after development after development. We, at the moment, persimmons are flying in, and I, I always get numbers wrong, but I think there was a recommendation they could build 170 houses. They're now going for something like 270, and they're saying, oh, we'll do two-bedroomed two houses. They're building 11 two-bedroomed houses, and the rest of them are going to be huge. So, you know, we need our local authorities to sharpen up and get a few more teeth and start listening to the community. And actually, what we don't need more prestigious houses. We need sheltered housing, amenity housing, um, you know, single uh, occupancy housing. Yep. Sorry, okay. this is my rant and I'm going to be quiet now. Honestly. Right. So uh, um, I'm just going to, so I'm conscious of time and I'm conscious that if the, the polling that we put up had housing as quite a high priority, but it actually had other priorities in there too. So I'm going to, I do want to move on, otherwise we use the entire meeting to talk about housing. But I do just want, I think, come back to David Adams. He is a national if not international expert in these areas. David, just some final sort of thoughts. And then I would, I do want to move on to community ownership, which actually was a higher priority in the polling. Mm -hmm. uh, and we haven't got onto that yet. David. Um, yeah, thanks Andrew. And, and thanks Katie. I, I have huge sympathy for what you're saying because I've experienced exactly the same situation elsewhere. So I think it's actually quite common uh, across many parts of Scotland. All I want to say is, um, just focus on what the Commission is trying to do in all this, because it's a huge debate and a huge issue. Um, and the problem is that by the time um, these uh, big developments hit the ground, a lot of key decisions have already been taken, and they've been taken in secret. So a key recommendation of the Commission, for example, is that there should be a transparency ob obligation on who is actually buying and selling particular pieces of farmland on an optional conditional contract basis. Because at the moment, there's no way of knowing how this is going on. And an equally important recommendation we have made is for a national public land agency that, uh, should we say, would, would meet the power uh, of many private developers, but would have the ability um, perhaps to channel the kind of land that we want to see developed through the land market and through the process uh, and ensure that there is a counterbalance, we say, to um, the power of uh, housing developers who in many ways are the only um, people who are doing this. Uh, so, as I say, um, 
it's really up to the Scottish Government as to where they wish to follow these recommendations, but I think the Commission has uh, set out quite a clear route map of how one gets to a different position, quite a different position on the development of housing in Scotland. Um, and uh, I, I don't know whether the government will take up that or not, but that is an alternative proposition having been put forward. And I think that's as much as I want to say, because there's an awful lot on the website to follow up. Thank you, Andrew. David, thanks very much indeed. If there's time at the end, happy to come back to housing, but I do think it's important we deal with other priorities that people have flagged for us in this discussion. There's 40 odd people and we've not heard from all that many so far. Now, in the chat, there's some, some, some questions about community ownership. I'm, I want to know if anyone wants to, to, to offer a thought verbally on, on the whole issue of community ownership. It was, I think, 60 odd percent of those who answered the poll said it was a priority that they wanted to know more about. If not, John, is your hand up, John Ingus, or is it still up from before? Uh, if there's no one else speaking about community ownership, I've always been in favour of uh, Leslie Riddick's thesis, which is really about devolving power down. Uh, she points out that I think uh, one of the facts that uh, our local authorities, we have uh, the largest body, which is the smallest uh, governing body, of any country in Europe. In other words, she gives sites instances of Nordic countries where 7,000 people would have resources passed down to them. And uh, I think that would certainly be a welcome uh, turn of events here, particularly in Ireland. You know, North Asia does some good things, but there's a huge difference uh, between us and them. And often what they do is not suitable for our end. Uh, so I think part of the community ownership should be devolve power down from the, our local authority to populations of up to 10,000. Thanks, John. So um, let's just talk a bit about community ownership and let's hear, hear from people who who answered it on, in, in the poll as being a priority for them. Community ownership's... Um, I mean, it's it's not it's not really a new idea, but it certainly took off, I suppose, about twenty odd years ago with uh, major purchases in the Highlands, the North Ascent, and in the Western Isles, and th these were quite big areas of land. More recently, community ownership has become much more of an urban issue, much more of a focused issue. It's very small pieces of land, it's buildings, it's often vacant and derelict buildings, and. Uh, and, and land. Um, and there are now hundreds of community controlled trusts or companies that, that control land. So there's been a big shift there. Does anyone want to, 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 um, oh, here's Lindsay. I didn't realize Lindsay Chalmers is, is uh, also an expert. Gosh, we're, we're, we've got loads of experts tonight. That's wonderful. Lindsay, I, I, I'm going to ask you if you'd like to contribute, please, because she's just contributed in the chat. But Lindsay, would you like to just offer some thoughts on where community ownership has come from over the last few years and where you think it's going and, and link that to North Ayrshire? Would you be willing to do that, please? Hi there. Yes, I can do that. I'm not going to turn my camera on because I'm not at my desk at the moment. <laughs> That's fine, Lindsay. We'll, we'll, look for, we'll enjoy your dulcet tones instead. instead. Over to you. Um, so Community Land Scotland is the body for community landowners. We were set up by some of the early community landowners in the Highlands and Islands. So our job is really to help communities kind of through the early stages of buyouts um, and help organisations share information with each other. Um, initially, almost all of our work was in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland, but particularly over the last five years, we've seen a growth in interest in urban areas south of Scotland. We had quite a few groups from Ayrshire's getting in touch with us recently. Uh, and we've got, um, within our team, we've got people who can work with rural communities or urban communities. So we're really happy to hear from anyone that's interested in exploring community ownership. Thanks, Lindsay. And, and just, just in terms of, so that's what Community Land can do. And I mean, Community Land Scotland has done a superb job. I, I, I mean, I will, I will absolutely endorse that over the last few while. Um, the, the sorts of questions coming through, for example, there's a question um, there from, from Karina um, ab about um, build, you know, house building and the role of communities in that. And there are 
you know, there are some good examples actually of communities, you know, buying pieces of land. In fact, not as far from where I live, there's a good example of a community buying a chunk of land and building a chunk of houses. Uh, and that is a growing thing. Just putting aside your community land hat, please, um, just Lindsay, just just um, sort of your thoughts on, on, on what role community ownership might play in Ayrshire and some of the issues that are being flagged this evening? Um, well, the, the contact we're getting from communities in the Ayrshire is extremely wide ranging. So I don't think we've had any communities asking us about housing, but um, we've had requests about land purchases, about shops, cafes, um, we're focusing on kind of on asset development assets that might be important to villages. We've had inquiries about town centres. So my colleague Christina, who works with urban communities, has been supporting a couple of town centre groups as well. So the range of possibilities that are out there for groups and communities is pretty broad at the moment. And we would we would always encourage communities to think broadly about what type of assets they might want to own. It's not just about land anymore. It's about any asset that might be useful in community ownership. And we do have a lot of communities um, who have developed housing, normally housing for specific needs. So often affordable housing where people want to create housing for families. Um, or we're seeing um, housing now that might be developed for people with particular skills that the community wants to attract. So again, there's lots of case studies out there of how that's been done successfully. And so thank, thanks very much in, in, indeed. And th this is a big subject, so let's hear what others have to say. It's worth worth pointing out that you've got communities owning thousands of acres, you've got uh, communities owning a fraction of an acre, you've got communities that own uh, community shops, you've got communities owning public toilets, you've got a community uh, that owns a bridge, there's a community that owns a cinema. Uh, it's pretty diverse already. Gordon, you've got your hand up. Gordon Keenan, let's hear from you. What are your thoughts, please? Hello there, yes. Uh, I've, I'm, my background is in housing and in uh, development trusts, uh, and I've also got relatives on the island, so I have some of the frustrations that have already been expressed about developments there. Uh, and I've read the paper, and in the process of reading the papers by the, the Land Commission, I've got to give you some credit there for some of the ideas uh, and the ways forward and the, the, uh, the quiet frustrations that you're uh, expressing around our political community uh, in government. Uh, maybe with the Greens there, maybe we'll start to take some of these things up a little actively, so I'm a bit more positive about that. I've got to say, I'm going to, be going to throw in a little bit of criticism here. Lindsay, you've had an opportunity there, but I didn't think you really offered us anything there in clarity. What I think we hear again, and we've got to stop this, we're operating at the margins. We are operating at the margins. People owning a, an old post office, people owning an old bank, in, in, you know, in, in extremis, really, with a, a paper handout from government with a grant for one year. This is about as sustainable as, well, as life on earth is if we keep living this way. We've got to look for more, and one of the queries I have is about the financing of this, how we can bring things. I've, I've, I've begun to throw something quite in separately. <clears throat> I sit as a director of Glasgow Credit Union. I'm not speaking for them, but they're the biggest community-owned credit union in the UK with millions, millions underspent for a whole range of reasons that credit unions are, are based on the idea of giving lending to people in need. But it's, 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 it's very contrived and there's, there's... But I watched, when I was the chief executive at Nielsen Development Trust, we had a wind farm that borrowed the money for the community owned the wind farm, four big turbines there. Meanwhile, the community credit union couldn't lend its money. We borrowed for the wind farm from Social Investment Scotland who charged us to, between 8 and 10% on our investment. It bankrupted us before I even arrived there because people forgot that purchasing it, then the interest gets charged on, then you've got to wait for the, the thing to be constructed and the wind to blow. There's a bit of, we need to find where the finances can be brought together here to enable us some ethical funds beginning to appear. But I certainly think we need some realistic funds. Today, Scottish Government has put out <laughs> pennies. You can buy something from a little bit of money. But that's not investment in community infrastructure. I don't want to just own 
the redundant cafe down the road. I want to do something much greater about allotments, <coughs> about the environment, conditions for life for my children and those around me. And I think, we, you know, so for me, the, where we can access the investment is quite critical. And I'd be interested in your ideas around that, Adam, uh, David, sorry, and Andrew and Hamish and anybody else, including Lindsay. Thank you. Gordon, thanks very much indeed. Let's, I'm going to ask Hamish to offer some thoughts on this and then I'll uh, go back open again. Uh, it is, I mean, let, let's be clear, there are no free lunches here. Public money is incredibly tight uh, and, uh, you know, it's going to get tighter if we struggle our way through COVID. So mm -hmm. it, 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 it isn't going to be, it isn't going to be straightforward. We have done some thinking and we've actually published some work on the whole issue of how do we how do we, f f I mean, bear in mind that, that many of the, the, the first, the early community buy land buyouts, I was involved in the first one in North Loch Inver, were, were privately financed. Noidart was privately financed. Egg was privately financed it, by, through philanthropy. So there are mechanisms of, 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 of doing this. Um, and let's not all point the finger at, at governments who have got a heck of a lot of pressures. Hamish, I mean, I'm just going to give you the, the floor, say anything, anything you like, but it'd be useful. I mean, you, you might want to refer to the work we did as well. Yeah, no, I'll pick up the point on finance directly because, I mean, I, no, you're absolutely right that finance is, of course, a central challenge to scaling up um, community land ownership, um, as, as it is for so many um, ambitions um, at the moment. And I mean, the first thing I would say is that there is a huge amount being done directly by communities all around Scotland to actually develop innovative finance mechanisms um, and actually when when you when you start to look there is a huge amount of experience there to tap into um, in some of the different uh, approaches to raising finance um, for for capital acquisition for revenue development um, so there are quite a number of different models uh, and that actually is one of the one of the bits of work we have published um, is some guidance on different models different financing models to support community ownership uh, and again, you'll find this publication on our website. Um, there's a kind of summary table, but there's also a report behind that that delved into the experience of communities on the ground so far um, in bringing different finance mechanisms together. Now, that, that gives some information and it takes us partway there. But I think we all recognise the scale of the challenge is still pretty big. Uh, and actually, government recognises that as well. Um, and last year, they asked us to do some further work on, on ways to complement the Scottish Land Fund with different finance mechanisms. So we, we know the land fund is there. There's a strong political commitment to the land fund. There's a commitment to double the amount in the land fund over this parliament. But of course, actually demand still outstrips that. Um, and, and it's a good thing that demand you know, is so high. But demand, as Andrew said, I suspect will always outstrip the, the public finance available. So we are in the middle at the moment of pulling together additional work on uh, other ways that we can be more strategic in Scotland, uh, bringing other sources of finance together alongside the land fund. Um, and indeed how the land fund can be used to help leverage um, some of that. So yes, we are looking at private finance, philanthropic finance. There's, there's some really good experience in Scotland on social enterprise financing, as you've, as you've hinted at, Gordon. And uh, we've got the National Investment Bank now. The challenge there, of course, is scale. Um, can we find ways to work with them at a scale that would, that would support that kind of investment? And the other thing I would flag is the, the emerging green finance. And, and while there is a lot of concern about the emerging implications of green finance in the land market and the private sort of sales and transactions, actually green finance offers the same opportunities to the community sector as it does to the private sector in terms of potentially bringing finance in to fund capital acquisition um, and development costs. So again, I think there is a huge kind of area we're only just beginning to understand on how some of that new finance that is there in, in very large amounts can actually be harnessed for the community sector as well. Thanks, Hamish. And, and I, may, I may ask you to talk a bit more about green finance because we haven't really covered that yet, but I'm, I want to hear from people in the audience as to what they want to talk about. Um, and if no one puts their hand up, I'll come back to you. <laughs> um, does anyone, anyone want to either explore further the community ownership issue? The, for example, the right to no one's asked about the right to buy legislation. There is there is some right to buy legislation in place. Some people think there's too much. Some people think there's too little. Anyone else want to contribute? No hands. There's Sally. Sally, would you like to, to offer a further thought? That would be great. Thank you. Uh, just a, a short thought. One of the things that's concerned me 
with the enormous squeeze on local authority spending over the last, what, 10 years, has been the seduction of owning your own uh, bit of whatever. And certainly North Ayrshire has been very sharp on uh, saying we're going to close all the public toilets and you can have them if you want. Now, you know, I'm willing to do my bit towards that. But what about real public amenities? It'll be libraries next, and then it will be something else. I mean, I, I get very concerned that, in fact, the local authority, wherever it might be, is abdicating from some of its basic responsibilities in communities, particularly somewhere like Aaron. Uh, so I think it, there is that balance uh, between what we as citizens see as the local authority involvement in whether it be planning or whether it be amenities for the population um, and the liaison between things like buses and ferries and things, and in fact abdicating all responsibility for actual activities on the island. And that would be a great shame. Sally, I'm going to come ask you to say a bit more because um, we, we get this, this thought from at a lot of these meetings. And, and of course, that's right. Um, you know, public finance has been incredibly tight. Local authority finance has been incredibly tight. It's not going to get, frankly, any better. Yeah. Um, and yet, consistently, election after election, we don't really vote to pay more tax on the whole. Um, so um, local authorities are trying to do difficult things. And... and and, and they find themselves with a, with a sort of shed load of things that are called assets, which are actually liabilities. Um, and they, they see that the that communities have a capacity to raise resource, not just money, but volunteerism and energy and drive. And so they see it as a way of perhaps maintaining those public services when, when frankly, the taxpayer is not willing to pay for it. I, I, is your argument in part, at least, that the taxpayer needs to be willing to pay for it? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I just wanted to make to get get yep. that clear because I think some people want because there people... are there are <laughs> communities that cannot afford yeah. to run the public loos. Yeah. Or well, or the community hall that is so essential to a sense of well being and sense of place for some villages communities and so on and so forth. So I think there is a balance to be struck and how they manage that, I'm not sure. I just think it's tipping too far one way at the moment. Thanks, Ali. I I'm sorry to push you, but I just think that, th that was really helpful um, because I think sometimes people feel, um, are looking for a free lunch uh, and, and I wanted to be fair to local authorities. I mean, there, there are some great examples where local groups have harnessed resource of one kind or another to do things that frankly simply wouldn't be happening under the current financial arrangements. Um, you know, I'll give you an example from near Pet Lockery, for example, where a community has taken over a bridge which simply would not be open to the public were it not owned and financed by the community. I can give you another example from near me where the community have taken over the public toilets. They, they just wouldn't be the open if it wasn't for that. And, you know, it's... As, it's, we, it, have, as we have on our own. We're Great. on the forest yeah. island and all our loos, on all our public toilets now are run by volunteers. Uh, but you know, there comes a point at which, yeah. but I, I'm willing to pay more tax, but a yeah. lot of people cannot afford to pay more tax. No, and, 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 and you know, that's the challenge. Anyway, th thanks for that. That's very helpful. Um, uh, Timothy's got his hand up, so I'm going to come to Timothy. Uh, Hamish, I was going to, I probably will come back to you on the a wee bit more about green finance but and the opportunities in there. But Timothy, let's hear from Timothy again. Over to you. I, I just wanted to sort of add to what you were just saying about, uh, about things not being available if communities didn't take take over take over and i and i do have some sympathy with that and i know that in north Ayrshire the direction of travel is with uh, with the council facilitating things within communities and communities then taking things on but it's sort of in a way sort of begs the question as what is the role of the council so i mean i i, I know what you say but actually it does that is actually one could argue the other way that in fact Councils are advocating responsibility when they're doing that at the direction of central government rather than the, 
uh, rather than on their own. So I would slightly take exception to what you say there. I think it, I go back to what Sally said, I think it is around balance and ensuring that balance is there. The goddess is within the role of the, uh, uh, within the role of the um, council to decide on where that they put their balance, but obviously that is also limited about the amount of funds they get hold of. So I, I do appreciate this. I think I make the point that it's not straightforward. Um, one shouldn't just blame the local councils for this. No, th th thank you. No, I, I mean, at the end of the day, councils can only do what they can afford to do. And my experience of talking to people in councils and elected representatives is that they would, they'll all tell you that, 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 they, that they absolutely don't, that they want to do more. They, they want to run public toilets. They want to do all these things. They can't because they haven't got the resource. So I just wanted to be a little bit fair. Let's, let's I'm conscious of time, um, about 15 minutes or so left, 20 minutes. Um, Hamish, I, th I think it would be just useful to elaborate a little bit on the green finance work. I know we're still working on that. We don't have the answers, but perhaps you could say a little about what we're doing there and, and how that might be relevant. Of course. So, I mean, green finance, what are we talking about in the first place? Well, we, we are seeing um, significant finance becoming available um, to help Scotland deliver um, its, its climate ambitions. And in practice, that means woodland expansion, peatland restoration, soil management, um, and indeed in an urban context, um, you know, urban um, nature corridors uh, and greening, uh, city greening projects. So I think the first thing to say is actually, it is, it is of course a good thing that private finance is becoming available to deliver this because actually Scotland needs it. Um, there, is, there is simply no way that Scotland is going to deliver the kind of land use transformation that the government has set out on for, for its climate targets without actually harnessing private finance to do that. The, the question, of course, is, to, is how we make sure that we do that well, um, how we make sure it's accountable and how we make sure the benefits flow widely. Um, so bringing fin private finance in is good. Um, there is, of course, some caution, as we've touched on, about the, the carbon trading elements within this. Um, so, so yes, I think we're right all to be cautious about the potential implications of carbon trading and new trading markets that are developing very rapidly around us, and we don't have the, the regulatory systems in place yet. Um, but of course, not all green finance is, is actually about carbon trading. There are very significant investors out there who are looking to deliver finance directly into wind expansion, peat and restoration. Um, and, and there are also investors out there who are starting to think more widely. And, and I think one of the key things here is about how we how we actually make sure that there is social and economic impact demonstrated as well as carbon and, and nature impact. And just just one example that I think might offer an interesting way forward. Um, recently, the, the University of Edinburgh announced a major um, carbon strategy to, to, first of all, remove the carbon from their operation um, and then to offset remaining um, carbon that they simply couldn't remove. Now, what they've done is actually thought quite hard about it. And rather than go out and buy land directly, they have deliberately said that they want to work in partnership with communities um, and find opportunities to deliver um, the, the, the land use that they need for this uh, through others. And I think, I think that's you know, a really interesting area of opportunity for us. Um, and perhaps we should be starting to, to encourage corporates and others who are looking to take advantage of the, the carbon opportunities through land to do it through others and indeed to, to channel that finance through communities and other land management um, kind of collaborations um, to deliver that. So I think there is, there is opportunity here to look at how we do things differently. And as I said before, we're, we're looking at both the implications for the land market now in terms of the transactions that are happening. Um, we're working with government to shape principles for responsible investment, responsible practice. Uh, and we will in the new year be developing a land rights and responsibilities protocol um, around the carbon and natural capital investment. Again, just to set out some clear expectations of what does responsible practice look like um, in this new field. Thanks, it's a big area and a high priority area of work for us, so thanks for that. Now, we've got about 15 minutes, well, probably a bit less, because I'm going to wrap up at the end by asking David and Hamish to just reflect on what they've heard. Um, happy to respond to anyone's remaining priorities. One, one area I, I just would mention that we haven't, no one's raised it, but which is quite important is the government's committed to a land reform bill in 2023, and that bill is likely to certainly major on the issue of how do we deal with the fact that Scotland has one of the most concentrated patterns of land ownership in Western Europe, if not the world. Um, and, and there are you know, significant consequences of that in terms of 
the concentration of power that goes with with land ownership and land rights, unelected power, often inherited power. Um, now, you may have no interest in that, and that's fine, we'll not bother talking about it, but if you do, please say so, because we've only got about 10 minutes, and, and it's going to be a big issue for Parliament, whatever, even if it's not a big issue for Ayrshire. Um, but please, anyone want to raise your hand or put something in the ch chat that you want us to, 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 to touch on? I'll probably come to you, John, but I just want to see if there's anyone who, who, I'm conscious of the same people putting hands up. I just want to check there's 36 odd people on the call. Are there others there who haven't managed to get, a, get in, who want to get in? Put your hand up now, please, which means click on that for any wee button, raise hand. Councillor, Councillor, uh, I, I can't get your full name, but Peter, anyway, so, uh, Peter, over to you, with a wonderful picture in the background of a huge boat. Over to you, Peter. Uh, Peter, you're muted. A couple of questions I haven't been asked tonight that I, I'd be interested in your, your take. I noticed in the chat earlier on uh, you're in favour of compulsory sales orders for Dalek land. That started in the Parliament three years ago and then died a death. And it's an area that I think we really need to move on. It doesn't matter where you are in Scotland or Britain, every high street's got a derelict building. Um, yep. Uh, I really like to push forward on that because people say compulsory purchase but don't realise the consequences of that, the costs. It's not the derelict building, it's what the land's worth and the compensation you have to do when you go down that road. But the other question is, is, is related slightly, but it's foreign ownership of land and what you can do about when you've got foreign ownership. And we've got a, a case that's been rumbling on in air for years over the, the station hotel, which is owned by a a Malaysian businessman and when you try to enact uh, I mean I'm lucky my previous life I was director of custom and excise so I know how to do it but even there it's years and years to fight to get hold of that building and that that land from a, an owner that's why compulsory sales orders and compulsory purchase orders are far more important to me uh, in getting hold of if we want to develop derelict and wasteland thanks Peter, thanks for raising that. And compulsory sale orders was one of a quite early piece of work. We did a pretty detailed piece of work with detailed advice. I'm going to ask David David Adams to just briefly say a wee bit more about that. It's 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 sitting with with ministers and with Parliament, and it's very much up to them whether they enact it or not. But David, do you want to just say what was involved in that and what what it might mean for local authorities and local communities if it were enacted? Well, it's basically the, people, the principle that people should not be allowed to sit indefinitely on vacant, derelict land, property, buildings, whatever it happens to be, when that's having a negative effect on the community. Um, and it's not so much, as Peter says, that the, the council themselves buying the land, it's actually um, facilitating um, the transfer of that land from someone who's doing nothing to, to someone who probably could do something um, providing they were able to acquire the, the land at a reasonable price. So um, it was, as you say, Andrew, one of the earliest pieces of work, and that is a very detailed proposal of how it can be taken forward. Um, the, the principle has been accepted by, by the Scottish government and, and, and by um, a, a broad range of little parties in Scotland. So. Um, it, it would, there was a promise to legislate in the last parliament and that was overtaken by Brexit and, and, and all the other things that went on. And there is now a promise to legislate in this parliament, um, probably uh, later on in the, the term of the parliament, not, not immediately, but I think whether that promise is fulfilled is obviously a matter for government and, and, and is a matter for the public to to express their views to, to government but as far as the the commission is concerned um the proposal is there it's pretty valid it's been well tested and it's ready to go or it's ready to go in the sense of being translated into legislation pretty easily so it, it's a political decision now as to whether that particular recommend or how soon that particular recommendation of the commission is taken forward into legislation and actually then gives the local authorities the powers they need. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, David. Peter, I can see you want to come back. Back to you. Uh, just a quick comment here. Yeah, I know the legislation, obviously deeply involved in, in when it was going through Parliament, 
what I'd like to do is get an appeal with the Commission and with the public in general to press the parliamentarians to get this in, in uh, under a legislative vote. We can't do anything without it in certain circumstances. And it's, it's hamstringing people and stopping development. It really is. But there are there are broad range of bodies that have been pressing and um, I mean, I'm, I'm not too sure it's the role of the Commission to press government any further, having produced the report, because we, we're advisors to government, but there's a broad range of bodies, Empty Homes Campaign, um, Community Land Scotland, so on and so forth, and those bodies at the last uh, land reform bill uh, did come together to give very clear evidence to, um, to the Parliament, so I guess um, it's really down to the stakeholders now um, to, to give their views to, to government rather than necessarily the Commission, because I think we have given fairly detailed advice. I don't know whether that, that's hear, what you feel, Andrew. Yeah, no, but we hear Peter's frustration. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, th and thank you, Peter. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, ob obviously, and people, people with a, a democratic mandate like yourself, you know, absolutely shoot and 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 in, should and indeed must represent the, those views strongly to parliamentarians. And we, we are not we're not elected, Peter. That's the point the point that David's making. So we don't have a democratic mandate. We're we're appointed by ministers. Um, but I, I mean, there are plenty of people who would who who and plenty of organisations who are saying that this is important and I don't think government disagrees because it was in the manifesto for the last parliament it got overtaken as David says and it's it's on the agenda again I, I wonder I'm just watching time here now I'm going to run out I very briefly on the foreign ownership I'm just going to answer that myself if you'll forgive me we haven't specifically addressed the issue of foreign ownership what we've done is done some really quite detailed work on 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 the whole issue of of power and ownership whether that power is held by in foreign hands or in English hands or Scottish hands or, or, or Irish hands or whatever. Um, and we've published quite a lot of work, but we focused on, on, on the um, implications of ownership rather than, you know, the nationality. Um, if there are specific issues that are specific to a foreign and not a Scottish owner, that would be a different matter. And maybe you want to offer something on that, Peter, do you briefly? Uh, just very briefly, yes, when a, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a foreign owner, owner or a foreign uh, registered company. When you try to take action, you can do nothing about it in this country. For example, okay, an understood. American owner is just the same as a Malaysian or uh, uh, another owner. And it's ensuring that when people buy land or set up a business in Scotland, that they're registered here. I'm not saying it's going to cure all the ills, but at least you've got a start of a 10 where you can go to get some answers, you know. Okay, that's helpful. And I'll, um, uh, yeah, I've made a wee note of that, actually. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Peter. Appreciate it. Right. Um, only about five minutes left. And I do want to give David and Hamish a chance to reflect on what we've heard. But let me just check. So um, Sally and John have got their hands up. I may come back to them, but I do want to give anyone who has not had a chance to speak the chance to speak. Uh, anyone who's not had a chance want to contribute? Last chance. Click your raise hand button if you do. S Sally, are you? I, I suspect you're telling me that, that that you hadn't taken the hand down, and it's my fault. It probably is my fault. I apologise. John, are you wanting to say something else, or is it the same? I really wanted to remind you that no one responded to the question about land nationalisation, which would obviously be relevant to the problem of foreign ownership. Yeah, so sorry, I apologise. I, I did try and get, and then I got distracted on that. So, I mean, nationalisation is, is not a new idea. That, I mean, the, the government after the First World War actually nationalised bits of land in the, in the Land for Heroes programme. Um, and uh, uh, government has compulsory purchase powers, which are difficult to use, but does use it. So, so land does sometimes get nationalised compulsorily. Um, and of course, uh, government buys land in the market, uh, or if you like, you know, takes into national hands in the market. So that already happens. We have not um, looked at the possibility of large scale nationalization, which I think was what you were hinting at. I, I, I don't honestly think that, that, that there's a political appetite or a financial capacity for that at the moment, uh, even if it was desirable. So it's not an area of work we've done. 
And I think this is the first public meeting when it's actually been raised, which is interesting. But thank you for that. Um, another, another one to stick on the wall. Appreciated. Okay, um, just in the last few minutes, I'm going to come to David first. David, we've heard a lot of different things this evening. Um, a lot of emphasis in, in certain areas, um, less emphasis in other areas. Just, just your reflections on, 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 on what you've been hearing. I, I, I think it just shows the, the breadth of interest, the breadth of issues in Scotland that actually do go back to matters of land. Um, they go beyond the planning system to who owns the land, what power they have, um, to what extent are they prepared to consult with or, 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 or share or take account of other people's views. Um, and, and it simply demonstrates how, how, how broad the agenda is. Um, the difficulty one has obviously is prioritising um, because uh, I, I sort of think that the entire time of the Scottish Parliament could be taken out with land reform bills, but obviously that's not going to be the case. Um, and, and, and we've got to, in the Commission, we've sort of given priority to things like housing, vacant and derelict land, common ownership, community ownership, common good, um, scale and concentration, natural capital, so on and so forth. Uh, but there's still a huge amount of, um, of work to do. And I just want to end with one, picking up this issue of land nationalisation, if I might, Andrew, because actually, um, if you think about it, people actually, in a sense, don't actually own the land. The land is almost is there. What they own is rights over the land. Um, and so if um, the state were to take in everyone's rights and say those rights are now owned um, by the state, they, they would have to give out new rights. OK, maybe leases instead of owning outright. But the issue where I think we have picked up in relation to the broader issues are about responsibilities in relation to rights. And whether you say that is nationalisation or not, I don't know. What we're basically saying is the traditional view um, that if you had the land, it was yours and, and, and you had no responsibility to anyone whatsoever. Um, all the work on land rights and responsibilities to say that um, the concept of what it means to be a landowner is changing in Scotland. And I actually think that's probably more powerful if we can get that to work than, should we say, taking in everyone's land rights and giving them out different land, land, rights, land rights. I think the key thing is actually to balance the land rights with the responsibilities in the future. So that's probably been the focus in a different sense on the strategic picture of, of land ownership in Scotland. Thanks, Andrew. David, thank you very much. You've just opened up a conversation that could last a couple of hours and use up another bottle of wine or something. But it's, uh, there are some hugely powerful philosophical issues in behind all of this, which we haven't got time for now. Now, finally, to Hamish. Hamish, we've heard lots of things. Just your thoughts as to what you've heard, please. Thanks, Andrew. Really helpful discussion to hear your thoughts tonight. Um, I, I suppose I'm struck the you know the theme that seems to run through many of the topics that we've discussed, from you know from housing to green finance to to, to common good to others, um, is is this fundamental one about local community and democratic accountability, um, and 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 the very practical challenges that you've been raising actually about how communities you know get a hand in decisions. Um, how they how they know how to do that, where to go, how to pull the resourcing together to achieve that. So that's kind of useful feedback for us to reflect on in terms of some of the practicalities um, that underpin um, some of the, the ambitions and processes that we're talking about here. So thanks for that. I think my, my final comment would be um, just to say to, to any of you, if there are um, you know, if there are particular issues that you would like to speak to us about more closely or particular examples that you'd like to draw to our attention, um, either of good or bad things um, happening that you think would be helpful, um, please do get in touch with us. You'll find contact details for um, our good practice advisors and, and the rest of the, the team on our website, um, or feel free to contact me directly and be very happy to hear from you. Henry, thanks very much indeed. There's a question just bob bobbed up about Crown Estate Scotland, but I'm afraid I can't, can't deal with it in the time available, so I apologise, we, we, we would have picked that up. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, I hope that's been useful. It's Land Commission's a, a small body um, and it's a young body, and we're trying very hard to make 
uh, a difference that's disproportionate to our size. Um, the, the feedback that we get from these things is just is absolutely crucial in doing that because it enables us to constantly hone our priorities, uh, uh, and we always learn something from these things. So thank you very much from, for that. Um, I'm extremely sorry, frankly, that this is a online meeting, even though in some ways they are good things and they let people participate who couldn't participate, because I often find in a village hall that it's the people who come up to you afterwards to tell you things that they didn't want to say in front of everybody else that are really valuable. So if you want to, to contact us and offer us some thoughts that you, you didn't want to offer in public for whatever reason, um, there is an email address. If you email that, that address, either with your thoughts or if you prefer not to put something on the record, email in and ask me to phone you and I will phone you and talk to you that way because I want to hear from people um, and I want to I don't want people to 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 feel they can't somehow engage I think this is this is very important um, this you know we need to be accessible and answerable to everybody regardless of circumstances so please do that but thank you all very very much indeed I also want to say thank you to Hamish and David for their patience and their very thoughtful answers a huge thank you to Jess and Posey who've been working frantically behind the scenes as I hope you've seen and putting up links in a very speedy way far faster than I could possibly find them and um, so that is really helpful um, lots more on the website. There's also a wee feedback questionnaire. I think Bose has just put a link up to it, actually. Um, if you wouldn't mind giving us feedback, we'd value that because we're all constantly trying to improve these meetings um, and we can't improve them if you don't tell us how. So that, that's very, very helpful. Um, I don't think land reform is going away. Land reform is a big issue of our day. Um, uh, it, it, the, the priorities will evolve over time. It's housing at the moment, it's carbon sequestration at the moment. It, for some people, it's big it's scale and concentration, but these issues will evolve over time. Um, so please, you, you know, constantly tell us how you think they're evolving for you. Um, but in the meantime, thank you again. I hope you have a safe journey to your kitchen or your booze cupboard or whatever you're off to do now. Um, I've really found that a most valuable evening and I'm, I'm very, very grateful to you all. Thank you and good night.